Man, so we're in our Church Hurt series, and we started at this place of acknowledging the pain that the church has caused a lot of people. Um, we talked about how bitterness can develop, that, that bitterness starts from pain that was inflicted on us, but then by, by living in that pain and focusing on that pain, we actually end up hurting ourselves. Someone might have hurt you, but you caused you to be bitter. And then we talked about uh, forgiveness and, and the gospel and what grace looks like by looking at the story of the woman caught in, in adultery. And last week, we talked about what God's vision of the church is, is that it should be a vision of beauty. It's his bride, and he loves the church. And, um, and so that's where we are in our series. And, and in the second to last one, and we're going to end it next week with Forgiveness Sunday, um, time where we'll have an opportunity to come and and seek forgiveness with one another to forgive people who may have hurt us, uh, to receive the forgiveness of the Lord. Uh, but before we get there, I want to talk about something that is, that is actually that required of, of us as Christians. In order to love like Jesus, you know, our, our overall theme in the teaching and even our worship and everything this year is, is more like Jesus, that we will be more like him at the end of this year than we were at the start of it. And really that should be our, our consistent desire in our journey with Christ is that we wanna be more like him. But in order to be like him, we, in order to forgive, in order to love, extend grace that's undeserved, we must first have peace. We have to have peace. We cannot represent Jesus well. And we can't be a good church if we spend our lives carrying offense, living in anger, bitterness, and unforgiveness. And I think in order to move towards forgiveness, we need something first, a gift that God has, a gift that Jesus brings with him. And the gift I wanna to talk to you about today is peace. Would you turn to Romans 12? And, and this is gonna be our main text for today. And we're gonna to go to verse 14. It says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I pray that peace would enter into this room. Lord, if we do not know peace, that we would encounter peace, which is not a feeling, it's not an emotion, it's a person, it is, it is you. Help us to encounter you today, in Jesus' name, amen. So I wanna speak to you today from the idea of finding peace. Now, in terms of church hurt, you know, we've been focusing on the hurts of the church, but really, this whole series can be applied to any sort of church, because uh, any sort of hurt that, that we experience in life. And then the truth is you can't be around people. You can't have relationships. You can't be anywhere where you're around other people without experiencing some type of hurt. It's, it's going to happen because people are imperfect and we, and we hurt each other. But I think it stings a little more when it happens in the context of the church. You know, one thing that we've done throughout this series is that we have a web uh, page on our website that, that allows you to anonymously submit a, a, a hurt that you experienced in church. And you can do that by going to crosspointelpaso.com slash church hurt. There's been a lot of stories that have come through there. You know, and, and, and one of them I wanna share today, and just for time, I'm gonna, I'm gonna paraphrase it, but, but essentially what the person submitted was, and this is, this is for full transparency because we're, we're, we're an honest church and we work through things. This was in our own church. Now, I'm gonna change details because I don't want um, anybody to know who it was. You know, this is the, the heart and intention. This is that it's anonymous and that we can learn from it and grow from it, okay? So this person submitted that they were sick and in the hospital and um, nobody visited them, nobody reached out to them. Um, and in fact, there was a few other people in the hospital at that time that were 
getting visits and getting care and prayed for, but they, they were not. And when they, when they came to church, um, they expressed that to, they said a, a member in the church and that that person said, well, I just don't have space for what you're going through in, in my life right now. And so the person wrote, I haven't come back. This is probably two years ago that this happened. And they said, um, I haven't been back to church since. Now, sometimes they're online. And these are the types of things that I think happen when we talk about this idea of church hurt. Now, I don't know the circumstance around all of this, um, but all I can say on the part of the church, if, if this person's listening, is that, is that we love you, and I'm sorry we, we missed you, and we hope you can forgive us, and, and I hope that we can reconcile that. Amen? You see, what happens is, is when, when hurt comes in, we, yeah, you can lead to bitterness, but I think the, really the first thing that happens is you lose your peace. You get hurt, and now all of a sudden you, you lose peace in your life. And, you know, this text that we started with, it starts, Paul starts with this idea, bless those who persecute you to bless others. You know, I'm in my, my biblical Greek class right now, and it's, it's super interesting. This, this word in here, to bless others, in the Greek is, is the word eulogio, which is where we get eulogy from. And it actually directly translates, instead of just bless, it says to actually give a good word, uh, a, a good report. To actually celebrate with praise is actually the better translation. So he's, he's saying, celebrate with praise, give a good report, give a good word to those who hurt you, to those who persecute you. Bless those who persecute you. You notice what it doesn't say? It doesn't say fight with those who persecute you. It, it doesn't say make sure your opinion is known to those you disagree with. It doesn't say cancel those who don't see it the way that you do. Paul says, no, no, bless, celebrate with praise the people who are worst to you. You give your best report to those who are their worst. Speak a good word over them. Celebrate with praise. You see, I think this is a good assessment for us in our inner spiritual life to assess where we are in terms of, of cultivating a heart like Jesus because a heart like Jesus is one that, that looks at the worst of somebody and, and brings a good word to it, a good report that speaks life into it. What do, what do I say or even think of the people that I have the most conflict with? What do you say? What do you think if you were honest in your heart today, in your mind, in your soul? Am I speaking well of my spouse, my children, my in-laws, my boss, my co-workers, my peers, my president, my former president, my pastors, my leaders, others in the church. You know, anyone can bless people that they like. That's easy. It's easy to celebrate with praise those that you get along with, <laughs> those that are kind to you. The world does that. That's nothing. It's easy. It's simple. But, but Paul is saying, Give a good word towards those that are the worst to you. That's challenging. That's hard. And to take it even further, this word eulogio, it's actually in the Greek, it's called a, a present imperative, which is a command for the present, like now, but a command for the future, which means you, you start doing it now and you continue to do it continuously. So you could translate this passage to say, continually give a good word and celebrate with praises those who continually bother you. Continually celebrate with praises those who continually speak badly about you. 
And I don't know about you, but realistically, like if I got up really early and I had my coffee and I prayed and I did a devotional and I filled out my journal and, and did some worship, I could probably realistically do this for like five minutes on a good day. Because that's something in, in, in my flesh that when, when someone is attacking you, when someone's persecuting you, that, that you, that you want to defend yourself, that you want to strike back. And, it, and sometimes I read things like this, and I'm like, God, you want me to love that person? Like, I can't even fathom that you love that person. Do you have any idea what they've done to me? What they've said about me? You want me to bless them? Do you know how that person has robbed me and hurt me and cheated me and betrayed me? I mean, if we're honest, this is a big command that Paul's giving to his church. It, it really is. And so when we look at something like this, the question is, how, how do we do it? Well, Paul gives us the key to this. We go back earlier in the chapter. Everything he said about blessing our enemies, hoping the best for those that are worse to us, is, I think, framed by the very first verse of chapter 12. It says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. Everything that follows is in view of God's mercy. In, in view of God's mercy, I, I will bless those who hurt me. Because you have to realize Jesus blessed you even though you hurt him. God's mercy. How much mercy has God given you? How much grace has God given to you? How much forgiveness has God poured upon you? Has God ever forgotten you? Has God ever canceled you? Has God ever turned his back on you? No, God continually blesses grace upon grace, mercy upon mercy over your life. Even though you haven't deserved it or earned it, he has given it. He goes on to say, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. What does that mean? That means to do this is going to be a sacrifice. I'm going to sacrifice my pride. I'm going to sacrifice being right. I'm going to sacrifice winning the fight. This is your true and proper worship. See, worshiping God isn't just coming to church and singing some songs. It's actually about how we live our lives. It's about the heart that we, that, that, that we, that we go into everything with. Lo loving people as we have been loved by God is an act of worship. Being merciful to people who don't deserve our mercy is an act of worship. Laying down our ego and our pride to bless others is an act of worship. To be a living sacrifice means to constantly die to ourselves so that Christ can continually live within us. Galatians 2.20. It says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. So really, in order for Christ to live in me, I have to die first. That's what it means to be a living sacrifice. So I lay myself down, God, so that you can be raised up. My, my ego, my gifts, my treasures, my talents, my, my opinions, my political view, my, my hurt. I'm laying it down so that Christ may live in me. See, one of the best positions we can take before the Lord is to be broken and empty. That's so counterculture. Because <laughs> culture tells you you should have it all, wealth and status, and you should have the best of the best. You should live in a palatial estate and have all the cars and all the things and go on all the trips and have all the right clothes and all those things, that, that your cup should be full and overflowing. But actually, the best place for us to be in the kingdom of God is empty and, and broken because God can come and pick up our pieces and 
mend us back together in his image. And he can fill us up with the things of his kingdom and not ours. You know, Paul, he says in Romans 12, verse 16, live in harmony with one another. And I'm gonna like massively throw things off real quick. I need somebody on the soundboard because I'm just realizing I forgot to tell the sound team um, that I wanted to do something. So that's my bad. Thank you, Ed. Can we give it up for Ed? Now, I'll, I'll use the piano. Let's do that. I'm a guitar player, but I'm going to use the piano. So we'll see how that goes. That's stepping out in faith. Now, <laughs> oh, there we go. Now, you know, Paul says this thing. He's, he says in Romans 12, verse 16, live in harmony with one another. And, you know, I love the word harmony as a musician because because I think of two different notes when I think of harmony, that there's two different notes coming together to create a full note, right? And so I can just be by myself, and I'm, I'm just this, right? I'm, I'm just by myself. But then if I have a harmony, if I add a third, right, I have a, a harmony together. And now that, that one note becomes something fuller. Now you could do other harmonies, whatever you want to do. But... When you bring the two together, you create something that sounds better and is fuller. Let's go up so it's a little less like scary, like hey, welcome to church. You know, let's let's go up. And uh, you know, so when you when you bring the two, see, either on its own are kind of kind of boring, kind of lame. But when you bring them together, it's something more beautiful. You know, and, and they start to to stack with each other. Now in music. When you have two notes that come together harmonically, then that's, that's a harmony. But, but see, the backbone of music, and like when we play songs here at church, for instance, um, they're playing what are called chords. So that's when you, take, when you take three notes and you bring those together, and that creates what is called a chord. And that is the, the, the backbone of all music. So instead of just the, just the harmony, like that, you add the third, and you've got and then you have a chord progression. And then you can start making music, right? Now, see when I think of things, it's like almost always music is how I relate to things. So I see harmony, I see the, the one, the, the two notes coming together, but then, then see, I remembered there's a scripture that says something about a chord and three coming together, right? In the, uh, Ecclesiastes 4.12, it says, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A chord of three strands is not quickly broken. And right there may be the key to repairing some of the hurt in our lives, something broken is that we've got to, as far, that's what Paul says, as far as it depends on us, I've got to seek harmony with, with this person or this place, this thing that, that hurt me. I've, I've got to do what I can do to seek harmony with it. But in order for it to really be full and really have wholeness in this equation, it can't just be the two things, the harmony. It has to become a chord. It has to be the three. And what is the third thing that has to enter in? It's Jesus, right? Amen, A plus. Lynn, you get two iced coffees. <laughs> God has to come into the situation. See, sometimes I think we either, you know, and look, there are some situations where there's not really a chance for us to maybe, maybe the person is no longer with us that hurt you. Or maybe it's just contact and communication. You, you, don't, you wouldn't even know where to start. So we, we recognize there are some things where you can't necessarily always go to that brother or go to that sister and work it out. But just because you can't take that step doesn't mean that in your heart you can't seek harmony. It doesn't mean in here 
that you can't seek forgiveness. You know, what I've found is I start praying about that thing or that place or that person and praying for them sincere, sincerely and genuinely and pray what Paul's saying, God bless them. And when you start doing that, it may not change them and it may not change what happened. It may not change the circumstance, but it'll change you. And, and, and the byproduct of that will be peace. But have you ever considered that to truly have peace, you've got to seek that harmony, but then you've also got to invite God into the situation. You're not going to have wholeness in any relationship, in any endeavor, in any healing, in any, anything that you do unless you invite God into the middle of it to hold it together. Paul, look what he says after he says, he says, live in harmony with one another. But then he says, do not be pro proud and do not be conceited. A harmony works. You know, in a choir, I'm going back to music. I really didn't, I really didn't plan this. In a choir, you are not trying to stand out as a vocalist. In, in a choir, you're trying to blend. So a, a choir that is, that, is, that is really working together well is one where they are listening to each other and, and, and they are actually matching volume. So they're all even in volume. So that when they sing their individual notes, everything comes together and blends in a beautiful way. So I think a harmony works best when both notes work together to produce the result. But see, what happens is in our bitterness, and our pride, our ego, we don't, we don't leave room for, for harmony to come in. Because a lot of times in our hurt, it's like, well, you did this and you did this and and we spend all this time yelling and, and shouting and bringing it up and very little time listening and praying and thinking. You know, we don't leave room because we're so focused on ourselves. When we get, our, when we get hurt, our, our, our instinct is to kind of withdraw and focus on our wounds. And, and we might need to do that for a season. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we need to take a step back Pray, heal, get some time just us. You know, Jesus, you see him throughout scripture all the time. He, it said he needed to get away, get alone and just pray. So one, if, you need to, if you're trying to overcome some hurt in your life, that's your first step is you've got to get you, just you, you go in a room, close the door and just get between you and God. And, 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 and don't ever feel like, I, I feel like sometimes we don't know how to, we don't know how to talk to him, but it's just, you just talk. God, I, I need you. Just talk to him like you would anybody. He's your father. And, and he knows. He just, so you got to start there. But, but the thing is, to move forward in life, and we're going to have some opportunities for that next week in a, in a very concrete way. But to move forward in life, you've, you've got to eventually get your eyes off of your wounds. And maybe the best place to be is at some point, you've got to get your eyes off your wounds and focus on his. And realize his wounds are a direct result of, of your sin. And I think when we have that perspective, it, it's... It's a lot simpler to forgive others of what they have done. Romans 12, 8, Paul says, if it is possible as far as it depends, on 18, if it is possible as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. A simple truth is that you can't control what other people do to you. You can't control how they respond to you. But you can control what you do and how you respond, as far as it depends on you. You know, Pastor Dan used to say, you could improve your marriage today by 50% just by changing yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I 
The, the truth is, is that my, my healing from hurt starts with my response. It, it doesn't start with that person's, um, for, you know, asking for forgiveness or apologizing or any of those. It, start, it starts with me. It starts with me forgiving. It starts from me healing. If you will humble yourself, if you won't be proud or conspirators, you may not be able to change the church that wounded you. But you can change yourself. By letting go of your pride and your desire to be right, you can actually bring peace into a situation. And maybe not even into the situation itself, but into your situation inside. And even if dying to self doesn't change what's going on in the outside, it will change how you feel about it. There may not be peace really between the two of you, but you can have peace within you. You can be at peace. You know what won't bring you peace is being right. You won't have peace by fighting over everything. You won't have peace by winning the argument. You will have peace when you surrender to the one who is peace. The disciples, one evening they find themselves in the middle of a giant storm. And everything was raging all around them, and they're afraid. And I'm sure they must have been arguing. Like, Peter, you're experienced, man. You didn't, you didn't check the forecast? Bartholomew, like, who are you anyway? Never even heard of you. We don't even talk about you. You couldn't even bring the anchor? It's easy to imagine they're offended and upset, and they're all fearful and Meanwhile, as this is all going on, Jesus is just asleep in the storm. Because the truth is, is no matter what's going on around him, no matter what the situation looks like, his peace isn't found in the situation, it's found in who he is. He is peace. And Jesus wakes and he approaches the storm and Jesus looks at it and he says, be still. And it is still. Maybe you haven't found peace in your life because you haven't really come to the one who is peace. One of the ways that the Bible addresses Jesus is as the prince of peace. And scripture tells us that he brings with him a perfect peace. Number two, the only way that we will ever have true peace is by coming to the one who is peace. You see, and what I've learned is peace, there, there's, I think, often a worldly version of these things and then a kingdom version. In, in the world, we have things that, that are circumstantial. So my happiness is dependent on things going right, my kids listening to me, my spouse, my, my husband actually did the dishes without me bothering him for three months. Like, it's those things but then in the kingdom, we have these qualities and these attributes completely independent from the situation because they're anchored not in our experience, but they're anchored in the person of Jesus. So I can be in the middle of the storm, suffering, pain, loss, turmoil, and yet still have peace because my peace isn't rooted to my environment. It's rooted to my Savior. Remember, Paul starts this letter in view of his mercy. It's, it's my belief, honestly, that, that when we recognize just how much Jesus has loved us, when we recognize just how much mercy he has shown to us that we didn't deserve, that even while we were at our worst, he did his best for us, even with all the bad thoughts and horrible things that we carry on the inside, the things we don't want anybody near us in our rows right now to know about, that in all of that, Jesus would see us and choose us and love us and die for us and give us purpose and meaning beyond ourselves in view of his mercy, th this is when we can begin to find peace. That's when we experience peace in our situations. But you have to know peace in order to have peace. Do you know him? One of my favorite things in life, honestly, is just to cuddle up on the couch 
with my two little girls and watch a movie. It's like my favorite thing. And sometimes I get the blessing of one of those little girls looking up at me and saying, Dada, I love you. And when that happens, I think I am the wealthiest man in the world. Thank you, God, for this blessing. And you know, if you're a parent, just like this love inside of you that like you love your baby so much and you just, you feel sometimes like you're gonna explode with that love. And the other day I I felt that. I think we were watching Trolls or something. Anybody else seen Trolls band together like 70 billion times? The other day I just felt God saying, and I love you so much more than that. And I started thinking, wow, I, you do, but I don't know why you do. You know, God cares so much about what you have gone through. He cares so much about what you are going through. And his desire is to embrace you and hold on to you like how I got to hold on to my little girls. And, you know, that's where peace is. It's in knowing his love for you. And so in view of his mercy and his great love for us, we can extend grace and mercy to those that don't deserve it. Because I have been so embraced and so blessed and so loved by my father that you know what? It almost doesn't matter what anybody else's response to me is. If I'm truly caught up in the love of Jesus, It doesn't matter how many people hate me, speak badly about me, persecute me, because it doesn't matter. Because my security is not found in in the praises or the critiques of people. It's found in the word and love of my Savior. Amen? That's the position we need to have. That's the security we need to have in Christ. And if, if you... If you're not there, and look, we're, we're people. We're in, some days we feel that. We feel loved by God, and other days it's like, I don't know why you love me, God. But that's where peace is. Real peace for you will be when you recognize how much he loves you. He, did, he doesn't want you to live in turmoil. He doesn't want your marriage to be characterized by fighting. He, he doesn't want another broken home. He, does, he doesn't want you to live in fear or anger or offense. He doesn't want you to separate from his bride, the church, because of hurt. He doesn't want you to live life bitter and broken and empty and resentful towards towards the home he created for us on earth called church as we await our eternal home with him. He wants for you to have peace. Now, Now, understand me. I'm not saying that you won't have trouble and you won't have turmoil. One of the probably most unpopular promises of the Bible is that you will have trouble. (laughs) But it says, take heart for I have overcome. So, but how could we have trouble but take heart is because our peace and our security isn't found in the trouble, the circumstance, it's in him, right? So you'll have these things, but they don't, they may affect you out here, but they don't have to affect you in here. You can have peace no matter what. But you must know peace in order to have peace. Peace is not emotion. It's not a feeling. It's, it's a person. It's Jesus. He is peace. And, and thank God for that. Because you know what the Bible says about him is that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Because if I leave my peace up to how I'm feeling that day, And if any of you are as emotionally unstable as I am, you can go through every feeling in in the course of not, forget a day, like an hour. You can be angry, upset, frustrated, happy, joyful, all in the span of five minutes. So to me, it's like, it's so much more reliable 
That peace is not just an emotion or just something that I kind of conjure up within myself. No, it's, it's, it's a person, and it's found in a person who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Somebody who does not get phased by things or shaken by things. So I, I can feel safe, and I can feel good about any situation I walk in because it's not about the situation. It's about him, and he never changes. Because my feelings are like that boat they were in that day. They're up and they're down and they're around. And some moments it looks beautiful and calm. And other moments there's waves and, and things are breaking. And, and So maybe what we need to do is look at our hurts, look at the storms in life as opportunities to rely on the one who is peace. The third one, the, 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 here's, here's the thing that I, that I, I realized in this, and it, and it happened through some conversation, I think with Judah, actually. But number three, our job isn't to still other people or situations. It's to still ourselves so that we can know the peace of God. See, I think that often we look at stories like this, We look at the story of the disciples and then we see Jesus go to the storm and say, be still. And we put ourselves as the main main character energy, right? It's like, I'm gonna be like Jesus. I'm gonna be the one who walks to the storm and I'm gonna say, be still. But guess what? I'm sorry to break the news to you, but me and you, we are a lot more like those disciples in the boat than we will ever be. Like the Jesus who slept in the storm and stood up and said, be still to the storm. My friends, we're not Jesus in this story. We're the disciples. That's how our lives look. That's how our inner thought life looks. Oh, oh my gosh. Peace is the work of the one who is peace. So so here's what we do is we invite him in. That's, That's our role. We invite him because he has the power. Jesus spoke to the storm and said, be still. But we often put the pressure on ourselves to be the ones, to bring peace. But, but God gave us a command. There's actually a way to be still. He said, be still and know that I am God. What's he saying? He's saying, hey, stop. I'm the one. I'm the one who calms the waves. I'm the one who stills the waters. Your job is, he is God. You are not. Your job is to trust. His job is the outcome. Jesus brings stillness to things. Jesus brings peace. Our job in the equation is to trust that and proclaim that. We say, Jesus, bring your beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news and proclaim peace. I love the word proclaim there. We've been called, what proclaim means is to make a public declaration to publicly declare the arrival of peace, the arrival of the king, the arrival of good news. With how crazy everything in our world is right now, there may be nothing more powerful than the person who can come and proclaim peace because they have found peace. The person who can bring peace because they know peace. In the culture of the day, as Isaiah would have written this, people's feet were really dirty. And they're usually calloused from long journeys, wearing sandals. And in fact, Jesus washed his disciples' feet because that was considered to be one of the lowliest actions you could do. So he demonstrated his humility and care and and love. You know, for Jesus to wash people's feet would have seemed so far beneath God. God. (laughs) And yet here in Isaiah, the word says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news and proclaim peace. Maybe what people need more than anything else 
is for us to let peace enter in, to allow Jesus to speak to the storms in our hearts, in our situations. It strikes me that I think in, in church a lot, we like to like declare and claim things. But what God has said is, I want you to proclaim me. You don't have the power. Jesus, Jesus does. He's the one. If you want peace, it's not because you declared peace. It's because you brought Jesus into the situation with you because you invited him in. Because you proclaimed the one who is peace. And it's not you, it's him. Do you want to have peace in your life? If that's you today, I want to give you an opportunity to pray and receive the Lord, to receive peace in your heart. Would you pray with me? Jesus, enter in to my mind, my heart, and my soul and bring your peace. I recognize my need for you that left to myself, I'm inconsistent. I'm up and down. I have hurts and flaws. I have sinned, I've messed up. But in you, I am redeemed and I'm made new, not because of what I've done, but because of what you did on your cross for my sake. I proclaim you as my Lord and Savior, and I pray that you would use me to proclaim your peace. In Jesus' name, amen. And then Paul closes out this letter with these words, Romans 12, starting in 19. He says, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Now, I remember kind of growing up that I always thought about this. I don't know if anybody else thought it this way. I always felt like that meant like it's like a passive aggressive thing. By me like doing something nice for you, even though you've been mean to me, that's like getting them all, oh, how could they do that? And, and you know, like I, I felt like it was kind of revenge in a way to do something good to somebody who's doing something bad to me, and then I've put hot coals on their head, and they're all frustrated, and they don't know what to do. But understand, back in those days, people would actually go out to usually a, a public furnace or fire, and they'd collect coals, and a lot of times, the women would, would actually bring those home, and they would use these, these pots that they would actually carry on their head with the hot coals. So it was a blessing to have coals placed on your head because you could go into your home and keep it warm and cook and have so it's an actually an action of hospitality and blessing and look this makes a lot more sense if you thought about it in kind of the kind of evil way that I did in verse 21 it says do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good Here's the thing, in, with hurt, we can't avoid being hurt. If you have been hurt, you were hurt. We can't change that. We can change how we respond. We can surrender and allow the peace of Jesus to come in. And maybe, maybe the way we overcome the evil that's been done to us is to overcome it with doing good in return. Amen? It's not our job to fix the other person. It's not our job to avenge the wrongs committed against us. It's not our job to make the other person apologize or feel sorry. It's not our job to repay others for the hurt that they caused us. No, we've been, we've been called to overcome the hurt that was inflicted on us by offering healing instead, to meet the turmoil inflicted in our lives with peace that has been given to us through Christ. 
to surrender our, our woundedness to Jesus and allow his wounds to make us whole again. This is how we overcome the evil done to us, by bringing it to the one who is always good. And I believe as we allow Jesus to work in our lives and to say, be still to our hurts and seek him, the one who is peace, that this blessing in Philippians will be present in our lives. Philippians 4, 7, in the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, which means, again, it's not predicated by circumstance or what's going on around you. It will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, as far as it depends on you and I, we will be bringers of peace. And we will have that opportunity to take steps towards peace in a very tangible way next week when we gather for Forgiveness Sunday and surrender our hearts before God and receive the beauty of his mercy. Would you stand and receive the blessing of the Lord as we leave here today? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.